So hi folks, this is Karen Trepti of Guiding Works Coaching. I work with amazing female entrepreneurs to grow their businesses, get them from chaos to clarity to cash. And I am so thrilled today to have Denise Duffield Thomas here with us. Um, I actually recommend her book, Get Rich Lucky Bitch to each and every one of my clients. It's made such a huge um, difference in my life. So, and I've started interviewing just a few of my favorite people in the world to share with my audience. So here is Denise. I wanted to say thank you at the top of the show. Most people are short on time and money. And money True. you can always make more of, but time is the most precious commodity. So thank you for your gift today. Oh, thank you, Karen, for introducing me to your lovely audience. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome. So Denise is the top money mindset coach in my online circles. And she's very, very generous in sharing her material. Anyone can access it. Um, Whatever your income level, you can access it. You can go out and get the book, Get Rich, Lucky Bitch. You can go for free to her, to her periscopes. Um, you can go to her website. She gives amazing material out on her website. So there's lots and lots of ways, of course, sign up for her newsletter and access those free gifts on her website. She also has the famous Money Boot Camp. If you want her individual attention, she's very generous with that as well on her Facebook group. Now, there are many, many different levels of entrepreneurs who might be watching this, Denise. Yeah. So I would really like to have your advice, please, for each one. Can we, can we, um, we're going to go for starting business folks, middle and then experienced. Can we start out with the starting then, please? Of course. What, um, what do you think we should start with? Is it money mindset for that, for that group? Yes, I, I'd love for you to stick with the money mindset and any other tips that you want to throw in for us. We're sure. happy to hear about them. Sure. So the first thing to know is that money doesn't make money blocks go away. So it's really tempting when you're, you're the start of your business to think that just the mere fact that you have money blocks is almost a sign from the universe that you're not meant to be successful. And what you're going to realize that as you get more and more successful, the money blocks in themselves don't really go away. What changes is your ability to deal with them, to not let them derail you. And also you'll have more tools and techniques and you probably have more community as you get more successful. So you can deal with them much quicker. So that's the very first thing I want to say to people starting out is that it's totally normal to have money blocks and spoiler alert, they're not going to completely, <laughs> completely go I, away. I remember, I remember that from your book, Denise, when you talk about how you even had, I don't remember if there were millionaires in there, but certainly very, very successful entrepreneurs who you're taking your money boot camp and you're like what the heck what are they doing in here yes because I always thought that money made money blocks go away mm -hmm. you know and that's why people want to win the lottery because they think that money solves their money problems mm -hmm. and it really doesn't mindset helps you solve your money problems helps you deal with your with your money stuff so the, the danger though at that very starting point of business is you, you think your money blocks are so real and you believe the stories that you're telling yourself around your money blocks. And the danger there is that a lot of people quit before they can really get success because they believe their money blocks so much that they become self-fulfilling. And I'll give you some examples. So it might be that you have a story that you have to work really hard to make money. And so you burn yourself out, undercharging, over-delivering, reinventing the wheel all of the time, losing focus because you're trying to recreate this story that I have to work hard or it doesn't count. And that's where, you know, we get those statistics saying that 95% of businesses fail in the first whatever. Um, and it's because you're living your money blocks. 
and not a lot of people can deal with it and get through that to the other side. So I think that's the most, the most important work you can do at the start of your business is look at some of your money stories, find out where they came from and be very clear about those money stories because then you can have the awareness and you can go, oh, wow, that's just my family story that money doesn't grow on trees or creatives don't make money or women don't make money. That's just the story. Okay, I can move on from that. So that, I think that's the most important work that you can do at that time. So what if, let, can we take one of those money blocks? Like we have to work hard to make money. What would someone do at that point? They say, oh yes, you know, I've, I've been working very, very hard and you know, I've been working for a long time and still crickets. I mean, what, uh, what would they do at that level? Yep. So I think the most important work that you can do is to clear and release it. First of all, clear and release the story. It might be that you have to forgive your parents or your ancestors for those stories that they, they gave you. It could be particular incidences that you remember from your, from your childhood. Clear and release those so you no longer have to hold those as a story. And that's hugely valuable for your own kids, by the way, if you cannot pass that on to your kids. Um, and, and be very aware of how those stories are affecting your business. So maybe you resist hiring anybody or delegating anything because that's the story. I have to do it all myself or it doesn't count. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's one of, my, see, one of my favorite ones. Yeah, it's because huge. I started, I, started del I so don't feel that way, and I started delegating in the beginning, and yes, it's been quite a journey, and oh my gosh, if I hadn't have started that like right away, it, I just feel like it would have taken so much longer. It does, but that's the self-fulfilling thing that women do. We go, well, it has to be harder, it doesn't count, you know, um, maybe at the beginning stages, you're undercharging so much that you have to have so many, so many clients or you have to just work, work and work and you're not allowing yourself to leverage and to profit from what you do. Mm -hmm. Another thing that people might be doing is they've put together a program and maybe they didn't have any people buy it or they had one person buy it and right. they think, well, I have to quit now. And the truth is that happens to everyone in business. You know, really the first course that you do, you might only get a couple of people and that's fine. But what separates out the people who then become successful is that they do it again and they do the, you know, they run the course again and maybe they have two people then three people then four people. But if a lot of times people do it once and they go, well, I have to completely start from scratch again. So they're pulling all nighters, creating a sales page again. They're creating something different instead of leveraging what they already have and then just improving it every time. Um, and you know, a good example for that for me is my, my money bootcamp. We've been running it now. Um, we've had two and a half thousand people go through it, but the first round had four people. Wow. <laughs> you know? geez, four people. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I could have quit. And then the second time I ran it, I remember feeling incredibly guilty that I didn't have to pull an all nighter working on the sales page because it was already done. And I felt like it was cheating. Did I honestly you use did. The same one. Did you use the same sales page? I did, but I felt so guilty that mm -hmm. people gave me money and I didn't have to sweat and mm -hmm. stay up all night for that sales page um, right. because you have to work hard to make money. It's so ingrained. So everyone's going to have a different behavior around that belief, but usually it, it comes down to being burnt out, feeling guilty of things are easy. Um, making things harder for yourself than they need to be. Yes, I think um, this is something, I mean, my tribe tends to be pretty overwhelmed and stressed out and not quite sure where to go next. But I just think it's so important that we take time for ourselves. I mean... I'm pretty driven too, and, and I'm certainly guilty. I'll raise my hand of just going and going and going. You know, 724, just like, okay, if I go hard enough, it's going to get there. But burnout is something that people don't talk about very much. And I think, you know, if you do it two years straight in a row, 
<laughs> and you don't give yourself any breaks at all, it's going to be inevitable at some point in time. Absolutely. So should we move on to the kind of more intermediate? Sure, let's do that. Okay. So what I see here is that maybe you've been able to master some of those blocks of the early stages and you've been able to create more things, maybe serve more clients, etc. What's interesting is you think there might be completely different blocks at this stage. <laughs> and there's not. They come, your block that you have, your own personal block, will, will come with you on the journey, let's say, as a little friend. So maybe in the second part, though, when you're becoming a bit more advanced, something else might hit you, and I see this very commonly, that you start to hit, maybe your demand starts to, to get higher. And so you're really feeling the nudge of, wow, I've, I'm serving so many people, I could really stand to increase my prices. And a big thing that comes up at this stage is that feeling of, I want to serve everybody. You know, I, I don't want to be unfair to people. Um, you know, helping people is more important than money to me. This is where you start to go, oh, but if I increase my prices, I won't be able to serve some of the people who started out with me or I won't be able to serve everybody who really, 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 really needs me. This is the, this is the opportunity where you can, again, work on that working hard, working smart thing and you can start to create things in your business that can serve a lot more people. Mm -hmm. And this is where people start to look beyond maybe a one-to-one -one model and that's when they can start looking at creating books, creating courses, um, creating a lot more content on your blog, creating free resources like free ebooks or free you know, mini courses. And then that way you can feel really good that you can serve a whole lot more people, but it's not you having to do it face to face with every single person who wants you. And when you do that, you can actually free up a lot more creative energy and time for yourself to earn more and to serve more. So I think that's the biggest, um, I think that's the biggest pain point at that, that intermediate level is that just before you're, you know, you, you're kind of burning yourself out one-to-one -one and you need to be able to have that time and creative energy to create a lot more resources for people. That's really interesting that you say at that level though, Denise, to go ahead and basically give more away. Yes. <laughs> but the, um, the mindset thing, though, it's a paradox because people go, well, if I increase my prices, I can't serve enough people and I feel really guilty about that. Right. But the actual opportunity is that if you charge well for what you do, you don't have to serve as many people one-to-one -one, mm -hmm. and you can write a book, which takes a lot of time and energy to do something like writing a book or creating a course. And then suddenly you open up wow, well, you know, and for me, this is where I hit it because I was, um, you know, I was starting to get burnt out one-to-one -one and I wanted to create my money boot camp and I felt really guilty that not everyone could afford my money boot camp. So I created my book, you know, and when you're at that stage, if you allow yourself to create those extra resources, then you can feel really good if someone contacts you and says, I can't afford to do your money boot camp, but I'm so desperate for this work. Then you can say, hey, my money book is $10, you know, go get that from Amazon or go to my blog because I've now got this catalog of, you know, hundreds of articles that you can go and read for free or take one of my free mini courses. But the, the trick is that it takes time and energy to create those things. Right. So you have to kind of give up that feeling of I have to help everybody myself um, so you can give yourself the time to create those things so you can help more people. Right, right. Okay, and then how about for those people who are more advanced who are listening to us today? What yes. do you recommend for them? Well, I think there's almost like a little, there's a little bit in between the intermediate and advanced. And the hump that you have to get over is an income ceiling. <laughs> this is happens for a lot of us, right? We go, I'm not allowed to earn any more than this. That's it. And it feels so real. And the thing is, this is the hard bit about it. It's not a boss telling you. <laughs> it's not anything else. It's totally in, inside. So my transition from intermediate to advanced was, felt like this. <laughs> I was like, oh, what's going on? Um, one of the most powerful things I did, Karen, was I looked at that income that I was stuck at. Mm -hmm. And I went, what is symbolic about this income? Mm -hmm. Like I really had to ask myself, what is symbolic about this income? And there were a couple of things. 
one, I was about to hit a new tax bracket. Mm -hmm. you know, and I was a, very unconsciously aware of it, but I was like, right. ooh. Um, I was starting to surpass my husband's income. And I was starting to surpass my uncle's income. So all of these things are very symbolic. And I think when you wanted to transition into that kind of, you know, and a lot of people, it's a very symbolic income level. For some people, it's, it's hitting six figures. And it's very symbolic and very emotional. Look around and see what is symbolic about that income level for you. You know, have you built up a story that you can only earn so much? And this could be, again, it could be a family story. Um, it could be someone who said to you, you know, artists never make much money or it's unseemly to make more money than other people. It's, um, you know, it's who needs more than X amount of dollars. And it might've just been drummed into you. Um, a story that I uncovered at that time was from my family. And it was a mantra that they said all the time. I mean, I, it, you know, when something is said so much, you, you just don't even realize it anymore. You think it's story. true, right? Yeah. You think it's true and it just rolls off. It doesn't even make sense. Words don't, it's just in, in you. And our one was, um, it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. And, and everyone said it so much in our family. And so I had to uncover that it was a story that I had, but that if I was a rich woman, I wouldn't be nice. I might be important, but I wouldn't be nice anymore. I would be a rich bitch. Um, so that's very important to uncover those stories. Maybe you've got a story that it's lonely at the top. And that's something that your family have said again and again. Well, it's lonely at the top. I'd rather have friends than money. You know, and so it's like, oh, gosh, it's really stopping, stopping you from just going to that next level that you perceive as being wealthy or rich or having made it. And you might think that it's for other people and not for you. Um, another key one for women at this stage is you think, well, I'd really like to go there, but I'm just going to lose 10 pounds first. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's like, I'm not quite ready, but when I lose the 10 pounds, then I'll be ready to go to that next stage. <laughs> right. And it's all just BS. It's all BS excuses. So if you can just uncover some of those things, what's symbolic about that income level? What stories have you told yourself about that income level that's preventing you from go there, going there? And what BS excuses have you got um, that you're not allowed to have it until you are, you know, X, Y, Z? Um, so the thing that's really interesting about it is you look at those different blocks at the different stages and it's not like that you become more enlightened. It's not like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy where <laughs> the ones at the bottom are, you know, basics and then you go up and it's like, I'm more, I have, I'll have more enlightened problems. You might have that losing 10 pounds excuse at the start of your business, in the middle of your business and at the top of your business. So it really is when I say to people, you only have one or two money blocks and they're just going to follow you around. <laughs> so there's a couple of things that you've said that I'd really love to talk about. Um, one is just to acknowledge you how sweet you are, Denise. I mean, for someone who has the, you know, the, the mantra or, the, you know, the marketing slogan, lucky bitch, the bitch part is just so far away from your personality. And one of the things that you said on one of your periscopes where my heart was just going out to you, I mean, you are a very, very successful woman and you're currently a millionaire. And yes. even on your periscope, you're like, well, I'm a chillionaire. <laughs> and yes. it's so, so sweet. Like, you know, even for you to be saying something like that, um, just, I mean, just makes it, I think, a reality for all of us. And what I'd like you to talk about too, I mean, for me, this is a, this is a big one. I um, mean, I think it is for a lot of women. Um, I don't think it's just because I'm from Tokyo, Japan and used to that more Asian role of a woman. I think it's really prevalent no matter where in the world you're from. And that's when you do get close to or you surpass even more so your husband's income. Can you talk about that a little bit, like how to get over it? And then you talked about your uncle, who was obviously really revered in your family. Like, how did you take yourself out of that? 
Yes, that was. Um, how did your, little, how did your I, husband react too? We want to know that. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it. I think part of the whole money blocks conversation is finding out areas that feel unsafe to you. And for me, it did feel unsafe to make more more money than the men in my life, and not because of how they would react in reality, but because of the perception that I had. So for my uncle, especially, you know, he was always the wealthiest person in our family, very generous. Um, and I remember, you know, he paid for me to come home from London to, to go to my nan's funeral mm. because there was no other way I was going to get home. My mum couldn't afford to, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I had a very emotional relationship with my uncle and very emotional relationship to his role as the wealthiest person in our family. And so for me, when I started surpassing his income, I had to really explore what that, what that meant, what, what I was making it mean, sorry. And I was making it mean that I was emasculating him, that I was um, taking away his pleasure of being a wealthy person in our family, taking away his ego, you know, all this kind of stuff. And actually, he probably wouldn't have a clue how much I, I earn. And he's nothing but proud of me when we, you know, when we talk about success, but I wouldn't, you know, say this, is how much, I wouldn't tell him how much I earn. <laughs> um, but I had to, that was actually more emotional to me than my husband. You know, that, that feeling of I am emasculating somebody and it feels terrible. Um, and so look at what's unsafe for you. You know, do you feel like it's unsafe to be wealthier because your marriage will break up or your parents will be ashamed and my dad is not in my life, so I, I didn't have that around my dad, but a lot of women have that around their parents. Mm -hmm. you know, that, and it's, it's very cultural, I'll find. You know, this is interesting too, Karen, from a cultural perspective, because some cultures, it's expected that you earn more than your parents because you are expected to take care of them financially, you know, to pay them back for the sacrifices that they've made for you. Mm -hmm. In other cultures, and I would say in the Western culture for women, it's it's kind of a bit shameful to earn more than your father. So I would say that's a hugely emotional one for women that they would feel disrespectful that they earned more than somebody in their family, um, that it was, you know, not their place to be wealthier than other people in their family. So I think that was way more emotional with my uncle than it was with my husband. But um, for my husband, I think I just had a conversation and we, we had many conversations about it. I would say, how would you feel if I earned more than you? <laughs> and we just, we talked about it a lot. And um, last year he finally, finally gave up his job. And this was, um, it was an interesting transition because when we started out, when I started in my business, he supported me. Um, and I said, you know, I'm going to make this business a success. So you're going to have to support me financially. And now it's the other way around. He's starting a business and um, we just, we try and talk about it a lot, but I really think there is much less emotional charge around it for us now than it used, than it used to be. Awesome. Well, you talk a lot in your book about forgiveness. Would you say that that's the main way to get over these money blocks or can you describe to us like how we are, how we're going to do it? Yeah, I think everything works. I think anything that brings your awareness Mm -hmm. And anything that acts as the pattern interrupter for you and anything that allows you to release the resentment and blame and shame and all that kind of stuff is really useful. Mm -hmm. I think forgiveness and Ho'oponopono as a forgiveness ritual is incredibly useful, but I don't think it's the only thing. Some people have done different types of therapies, different types of um, healing modalities, but it's really just about clearing it and, and releasing it because women, you know, we just take on so much and it's mental and emotional clutter it's like trying to do your work on a laptop that has 50 different programs running and you know you just you can't do it so I'm not dogmatic about any one particular modality because I think everything everything works and the intention is so important um, but even just having that awareness of wow you know I've got this pattern of doing this um, and having that awareness to go ah oh, I'm doing it again. Um, <laughs> doing it again. Um, having a community around you who are speaking that same language, so you can go, "Hey guys, I'm doing it again." Um, and you know, and just the ability to choose something different. You know, so I do think I do think forgiveness work is one of the quickest and easiest ways to do that. 
Can you talk to us a little bit, please, about intuition, like where you think that plays into all this? Um, you know, I had a story for a long time that I wasn't a very intuitive person, mm. um, that I was very practical and all that kind of stuff. And I think now um, it's again, right, when you release all that crap, and you release all those programs that are no longer serving you, I think you do have more energy to work on maybe the higher realms of things. Um, and for me, releasing some of that gunk that I used to just, you know, sit and worry about all the time has given me um, not new superpowers, but it's given me just a bit more creative energy to trust, um, to trust myself a little bit more and to, um, you know, just to be a little bit more of an efficient um, machine, I suppose. <laughs> um, and I still, I wouldn't say that I'm a hugely woo woo kind of person, but I've definitely developed my intu intuition a lot more and I've trusted my intuition a lot more too. Okay. And then you talk a lot about goal setting in your book. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, please? Sure. Now it makes me laugh because I just recently did an article and it's like, what's the perfect way to goal set? <laughs> I, get, I get this question a lot, right? I get people who in my boot camp go, Denise, like, should I write it like this or like this? And how many times a day should I write it? And should I write it, you know, a computer or a notebook? What's the best way? And the answer is the intention is way more important than the method. Mm, that's and if you, get, if you get caught up in the method, it's just another perfectionist racket mm. that you're running on yourself. And like, I'm only, I only deserve to hit my goals if I write them out five times a day in gold ink while I'm standing on my head and, <laughs> you know, eating and meditating five hours a day. And it's just like, dude, I don't care how you write them down. And the universe doesn't really care either. And anyone who tells you that there is one way to write down goals, it's just like, oh, no, just do it. You can scribble it on a piece of paper one day. You can write it in the present tense one day. Maybe one day you can just write a story of like, this is my life. You can, um, sometimes I have, a, I have nursery rhymes that I sing to my daughter that have my goals in them. Um, you know, just try every way. I make my passwords my goals. I um, have Pinterest boards of my goals. Mm. I, you know, have my screensaver on my phone as one of my current goals. All of those things compound together. There's no one right way to to set goals okay so it's really just the message to ourself um, you also talk about these lists I mean I I love them and it's really fun to click them off as well and those are the lists of be do and have and one of the things that I really love about that too I mean sure there's plenty of things on my have list um, but the be and the do to me are very precious because when I've done a lot of goal setting in the past and, and written out my ideal day and so forth, one of the things that that exercise really did for me is it made it so crystal clear, Denise, like how many of those things I already have. And yes. if I don't already have, I mean, like how abundantly rich I already am. And if I don't already have them, it's so easy for me to pinpoint. I mean, one of my examples is um, quilting. I love to quilt. I haven't quilted in a long time. The only person that's keeping me from doing that is me. Yes. And so I think that exercise really has a lot to to do with it too. Yes, I agree. And the other thing is, when, um, I think sometimes when you start out writing goals, you think you want a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed now from being around more successful women is that the more successful they get, they actually do want less stuff in their life. Mm -hmm. And life becomes a lot more simple. And a lot of um, my successful friends, they're not minimalists, but they're really deliberate about the things that they bring into their life. They really make those decisions based on choice, discernment, um, mm -hmm. not out of a, not out of compensation. And, um, and I've, I've definitely experienced that for myself too. I buy a lot less stuff than I thought that I did. And, and life is a lot simpler and it's more about the bee and the experiences and 
and who do I want to become? Yeah. Yeah. And you talk a lot about decluttering too. I mean, you talk about it. Marie Kondo talks about it. Um, I'm a big fan. I mean, my 14 foot quilting machine, which is right next to me that, um, was really filled with about 14 feet worth of clutter. And I now have it down to like one stack of notebooks with a little pieces of paper and a few business cards that, I mean, I'm almost there. I'm so excited just to get that cleared off. And, and it just releases a lot of energy somehow. I wouldn't have thought, you know, just little pieces of paper. But if you want to talk about decluttering a bit, I love the way you talk about decluttering our head and our physical surroundings. Absolutely. I think for a lot of us, it does start um, mentally and emotionally. Mm. And that's where the forgiveness work comes in, really taking an inventory of some of the things, experiences of your life that you have to release and let go. Um, And once you do that, I think a lot of us start to look around at our physical environment and see what are we tolerating here? Um, What things no longer serve us? What things are in our life based on those old stories that we've let go? And, um, and what things are we holding out uh, onto out of guilt, resentment, obligation, etc. Uh, so I, th- I do think it's a really natural progression. And I really love um, Marie Kondo and how it's just taken the world by storm now because it's just, um, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing because I think we'll, we'll consume less and people will consume more deliberately. And, you know, and that whole thing of does this spark joy is just, it's such a symbolic thing for women, you know, well, do my friends spark joy? Does this business spark joy? Does this client spark joy for me? I think it's a wonderful, simple question. And, um, and I realized too, recently, um, we had someone in our house and she's going, wow, you guys are so minimalist now. And I don't think we are. I still think we've got more to declutter Uh because it's become my new normal. And I don't hank, I don't hunger after stuff anymore because I just I feel quite content. Yeah. And maybe that's the thing of when you look at you when you do it from a mental and emotional part, you don't need to fill your life with stuff to compensate anymore. Um, and I, I always, whenever I've got a goal, whenever I've got a big goal, my first step is to declutter, and I declutter anything that's symbolic to that goal. So if you want more clients, go and declutter your old client files or your old business files. Maybe you've got brochures from a failed business hanging around or Mm. something like that. Every time we want a new house, we start packing and we start decluttering. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, every time, if you want to lose weight, you have to go and declutter your cupboard in your kitchen. It works for everything. Amazing, amazing, yes. And to me, it always amazes me like, how much emotional energy it takes to declutter. I mean, I have to be in a certain, I have to be in a very stable frame of mind to do it. And like some of the papers that I got rid of from five years ago, six years ago, little notes, I mean, I just don't need them. It's that time is, that time is gone. Um, Speaking of time, I would love to, I know we're, we're getting close to the end of this interview here, but I work a lot with my clients on time management, and I was wondering yeah. if you could talk to us about that a little bit. Well, my answer is always the same for everything. This is how I answer every single question that anyone ever gives me, is you don't have to be perfect at it. Yeah. <laughs> and I know I say this for everything. But it's true. I think sometimes time management, um, if you're not good at it, you feel like you have to be perfect before you're worthy of whatever it is that you think time management is going to give you. And people often think that I'm really super organized. And um, I'm really not. Like I've kind of, um, I have some habits in my life, like I try and batch videos. Mm -hmm. um, So that saves us time over the year. But I think it's more that I'm really lazy person. (laughs) And so I like to try and find the shortcuts rather than necessarily the most efficient or perfect way to do things. Um, The other thing is, if you look at it from a decluttering point of view as well, you know, declutter the things in your life that don't really matter or things that you're putting in your life out of guilt, obligation, resentment, et cetera. So I'm kind of good at that now. And I've had a few people, um, remember I bumped into someone in town who reads my blog and she said, oh, you must be so busy. You know, I won't keep you. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not busy. 
And <laughs> sometimes when you say that to people, it's like it's a real taboo to admit that you're not a busy person. And I'm kind of not. I feel very chilled about my schedule and I only put things in there that I really want to do. Yeah. And, um, and I'm pretty good at decluttering the stuff that I don't want to do. Again, mostly out of laziness than anything else. So I think that's my philosophy on time management. Okay. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up for today. And it sort of gets us back into that loop of like, the number of days that 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 driven sense of oh I've got to work so hard to make my business a success and I'm always teaching people to really just have joy have joy in what you're doing um, so I'd like to give you the opportunity I'm sure that a lot of people on here already know you know your work but you do have a den guide coming up for your fabulous money boot camp for people who um, want to be on the payment plan. So do you want to talk to that a little bit? Absolutely. So this is coming up very soon. It's the 28th of Jan mm -hmm. at 9 p.m. Eastern USA time. Mm -hmm. And this is for anyone who wants to pay off the money boot camp over 10 months, which is really, it's quite a long time to pay it off. And, um, and it was an introductory offer that we wanted to do to make it affordable for people. Um, and you know, what's great about doing it on a payment plan, and there's nothing wrong. I do courses on payment plans all the time, by the way. Um, you, can, you can work through your money blocks as you're changing your money situation. And we've had people come back to us and say, you know, I've manifested more money. Can I just pay it off now? <laughs> like, yes, no problem. Um, but it's, it gives you an opportunity to be in a wonderful community of women who are all in that conversation around money. Some of them are beginners, some of them are intermediate, and some of them are advanced business owners, and they're still learning the same lessons around money. And we have people who have been there for four years, and they keep on hitting big income goals, and whenever they hit a new one, and they think it's real, they hit a new income plateau, they go right back to lesson number one with everybody else. And that's a really important thing to know, that everyone is everyone is learning the same thing, even though their businesses might be different. Um, and I assume Karen, you're going to put a link there as well. Um, but if you just go to luckybitch.com slash bootcamp, and I'm sure Karen has a link there for you, you yeah. can find out about the bootcamp, the kind of women and the professions of women that are in the bootcamp and, and really why you should join. And you know, and, it, and if a payment plan is useful to you, then make sure you join by the 28th of Jan, 9 PM Eastern. Okay, Denise. Well, I'm going to stop the recording now. Is there anything else that you want to share with, with our audience before I head out? Yes. My final um, message is always that why not you? You know, everyone's got excuses about why it can't be them, whether it's, you know, the BS excuses I've mentioned, I have to lose weight or I'm not smart enough or if I was a little bit taller, maybe I could be more successful. You know, everyone's got their own BS excuses. It's completely normal to have money blocks. But why not you? Yes. Why not you? And it is your time and you are totally ready for the next step now, not sometime in the future. You're ready now. Beautiful, Denise. And I will oh, add. That's it. That's the message. <laughs> yeah. Today is the day. And I will add to our audience that if you haven't seen Denise's talk that she gave in London, about how a man sells and how a woman sells. You've got to run right over there and watch that. It is so true, and that's what makes it hilarious. So thank you, Denise. I'm going to stop the recording, and uh, we wish you well. Thanks, everybody.